G'day everyone. My name's Ebony Bennett. I'm the Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and I can see our attendees uh, flooding in as we speak. Uh, welcome to the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. Uh, the Australia Institute is Canberra based and Canberra is Ngunnawal country and I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past and present. More than 20,000 people have registered for one of these webinar series since we began them in March. And I wanna thank you all for coming along today and for your support. And just a few tips before we begin today's webinar to help make sure that things run smoothly. So firstly, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can type in questions to our panelists. And you should also be able to upvote uh, questions from other people and make comments on their questions as well. If you'd like to ask your question live to the panelists in the second half of the webinar, there's a raise your hand function. I'll see a little hand emoji and I can call on you in the second half. And lastly, this discussion is being recorded. Um, so you can hop out now if that's not for you. But also if you're registered, we'll send you a copy of the video recording and put that up on our website afterwards. Um, so you can access it there. Um, <clears throat> and today we're talking about the success of the Aboriginal health response to the pandemic. And we're delighted to be joined by four Aboriginal health professionals who we'll introduce very shortly. Um, but this is obviously uh, a huge uh, issue for Australia uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, particularly remote communities, being amongst some of the most vulnerable uh, to a pandemic like COVID-19. Uh, but to introduce our panelists today, I'm going to welcome um, Professor Fiona Stanley. She's an epidemiologist and patron of the Telethon Kids Institute and was named Australian of the Year in 2003. She's been a vocal advocate for the needs of children and their families. Uh, and today, as usual, we'll also be in conversation with the Australia Institute's Chief Economist, Richard Dennis. But thank you, Fiona Stanley. Thank, thanks so much, Ebony, and thanks for, for setting this up. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm in, actually in Melbourne on Wurundjeri country today, and I always like to acknowledge the past and present injustices, the fact that the land was never ceded, and also uh, acknowledge any First Nations who are on the webinar. Um, and of course, I'll be introducing my Noongar colleagues uh, from WA soon. Um, this is a really important issue, as you said, for us. Um, COVID-19 is a huge concern to First Nations in Australia. Um, in the H1N1 flu epidemic in 2009, First Nations had a higher rates um, of disease. There were more hospitalizations and deaths than all other Australians. Um, Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people tend to have higher rates of chronic disease. Many live in poor conditions um, with extended family, all of these being risk factors and in poverty, which is another risk factor for everything. Uh, um, and the concerns were not only for the remote dwelling uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but for those in urban centres, because the vast majority of Aboriginal people actually live in urban centres, 80% of them live in urban centres. Um, so what happened? Uh, well, uh, these results are quite extraordinary and I think we should be shouting them from the rooftop. So I hope that the Australia Institute's a good rooftop. Um, only 60 cases nationwide. If we had the same risk, um, if, if, if First Nations had the same risk as, as non-First Nations, we would have had 215 cases. But of course, we would have expected more than that because of the high risk. None were in remote and very remote communities. 15% only 15% were hospitalised, none in intensive care, uh, there were no deaths, and the latest data that we have shows that there were absolutely no cases that were caught in the Black Lives Matter protests. So they were conducted really well by Aboriginal leaders there. Now this is a much better outcome than non-Indigenous people in Australia. The gap is completely reversed, and it's better than any other Indigenous nation internationally. So. How did they do it? You know, what does this mean, this success mean for future Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services? And so it's just my real pleasure to introduce to you four outstanding experts, health experts, um, all from WA. Um, the first is Leslie Nelson. 
um, who is the chief, uh, the CEO of Southwest Aboriginal Medical Service. Leslie has a huge experience in health services administration and has the most amazing plans for a holistic, culturally enriched health and wellbeing service in Bunbury. Um, so very warm welcome to you, Leslie. Then we have Francine Eads, who is a, a nurse and epidemiologist, who is the currently the, the chairman of the board of Durbal Yerrigan, which is the Perth Aboriginal Medical Service. And Francine, again, has a huge experience, particularly in research, as well as healthcare um, in, uh, in various uh, uh, jurisdictions. Then uh, Professor Sandra Eads, um, who uh, uh, has come just recently from professor, being professor at Melbourne University, but is Noongar, and has come back to Western Australia to be, wait for it, the first uh, Indigenous Dean of any medical school in Australia. And she has become Dean and Head of Health Sciences at Curtin University. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Daniel McCauley, who is the Director of Kurunkong Furniture Kellogen uh, at Edith Cowan University, which is the Aboriginal Centre there, and has significant responsibility for the Aboriginal Health InfoNet. Um, so that might be something that people are interested in. Um, and uh, so without further ado, it's my huge pleasure to introduce uh, these group to you and ask Leslie to kick off. How did it, how did it happen? How did well, you do it? How did you do it? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for that um, warm welcome. Um, we've only been, we've just been through a unprecedented and unprecedented um, journey in terms of being able to address a pandemic for the first time. And um, I, I would like to say to acknowledge all those CEOs and Aboriginal Community Health Services and their workforce out there right across this country. We have over 140 three Aboriginal community controlled health organisations that have worked remarkably well on the ground and at the local level uh, to capture and, and to, to deliver the services that are needed. And our Aboriginal medical services uh, are very much a trusted service that had to build capability and adapt very quickly uh, to what was about we were about to embark on. I think it's really important to remember uh, the strategies and the challenges that we put in place at the local level um, were expanded on, but they were also challenged up to and um, through our state peak bodies and affiliates uh, and then on to the national level where we know that um, at the national level, um, the opportunity for NACHO uh, to be able to uh, provide guidance and advice to the Commonwealth Government is crucial to space in how we were to go forward. So we knew we had a really important role on the ground uh, to ensure that uh, we could um, protect our people, uh, protect our workforce and protect the services because we had to uh, continue delivering our services uh, to households and individuals that are very vulnerable in our community uh, where we see many issues um, outside of the clinical domain into the social emotional wellbeing space. So we knew that we had to respond very quickly and adapt um, in all areas, in our clinical areas, in our communications, and getting this message out to our people, uh, and also in our workforce and how we were going to look after the people that were delivering the services on the ground. You know, making sure that uh, the um, early response planning, which allowed us to be ahead of mainstream in many places um, in regards to the hygiene and key messaging that we needed. And that early response allowed us to implement strategies for communication. In some organisations, uh, Facebook played a very big part of this, um, our web pages, but the connections that we built were very robust. Uh, in Western Australia, we saw very quickly CEOs coming together uh, through the peak body uh, to ensure we had similar messages that were consistent throughout Western Australia. And, and that occurred also throughout, throughout the country. Very important, um, we had to, in a culturally appropriate way, uh, deliver the strong messages, the guidelines and the protocols that were put in place by the Australian government to ensure that they were getting out to our people and to protect our people uh, and, and to ensure the trust uh, that we already had with um, our communities 
uh, we were able to facilitate and ensure that we could coordinate this so that, you know, with the very limited resources that we did have, we saw many issues that uh, emerged that we weren't um, prepared and ready for, but we worked closely with others to ensure that we were able to implement and execute those messages and the, and the policies that we needed to put in place to keep in, and ensure that we were able to follow those guidelines. But at the end of the day, uh, be able to you know, protect, our, protect the people and the communities uh, because we knew that if this, um, if, if this got into our communities, uh, it could have devastated the Indigenous community in this country. So I think we were very well positioned um, to, to deliver it. We just needed to ensure that, you know, we had the resources. Uh, we did come together um, as a very strong sector here in this space, um, taking guidance from all the areas that we knew we had to and um, follow through, but ensuring that we did it in a way that our, our communities were able to reach out to us and we reach out to our communities uh, to ensure that we had access to clients, uh, to be able to uh, work with the agencies where we're doing the screenings, uh, to be able to ensure that the right messaging was getting out because there was a lot of messaging in the space and it was important that there wasn't, you know, uh, the messaging didn't get, um, um, wasn't, you know, miscommunicated to our community. Uh, we had to ensure the continuity of care for our existing clients um, so we saw the um, Aboriginal community control sector um, galvanising to look and secure resources such as further funding, submissions, um, looking to uh, the leaders in this space. Uh, the Institute for Urban Health uh, in Brisbane played a huge role in accommodating to assist with, um, you know, uh, services for isolated elders. Uh, the clinical and the communication um, information that was uh, being directly delivered to the Aboriginal Community Control Services was um, absolutely critical for us to, to, to be guided by. And we also saw that, you know, our role at the local level um, was critical. The pathways that we created uh, for our guidelines and for the the World Health Organization practices uh, and the updates and the strict clinical assessment pathways were implemented. And um, we knew that our communities trusted us. And so we were able to go out there and advocate and um, be very clear you know, about many of the issues where we needed support. And we looked to the corporate spec sector. We also looked to government uh, to assist us in that process. But there was a lot of work that was being undertaken and many of the things we achieved were well ahead of mainstream in some aspects. So, you know, um, making sure our workforce was um, continued to uh, be able to deliver these really, really important messages. And um, what we do need to look forward to is how do we now go ahead and analyse this uh, and have feedback from those communities about the work that was delivered. Played a very important role. Leslie, thank you so much. Your leadership is um, just that one thing you didn't mention was your own leadership. Um, we'll now move on to Francine, um, the CEO of Doval Yerrigan. Francine, looking forward um, to what you have to say. Yeah, the chairperson of Doval Yerrigan. Um, just want to acknowledge that we are um, here on uh, the ancestral traditional uh, country of Wajak Noongar people. Um, I just want to acknowledge the extraordinary leadership of our CEO and medical director and all of our team at Durbal Yurigan Health Service. It was quite a rapid response. Like Leslie said, we had strong leadership and um, partnership with um, the protect, health protection branch at the WA Department of Health, but leadership through daily communiques from the Aboriginal Health Council of WA uh, in terms of our what our responses should be in terms of COVID-19 and our response. Um, we rapidly changed what our uh, waiting rooms looked like, really stripped them back bare and ensured social distancing and, uh, you know, our four clinics across Perth. We had staff outside of each of our um, entry doors checking people's temperature, um, you know, encouraging good hand hygiene and, um, 
you know, having a one-way path through our clinics um, and ensuring that people kept their distances from each other, but really reassured our community um, and made sure that our messaging was consistent. Um, so there were huge changes in terms of our infection control. Um, you know, people were separated and there were stages throughout our clinics where people sat in terms of their journey through, in terms of accessing our GPs and primary healthcare teams. Um, there was consistent messaging and training and upskilling of our staff in terms of what COVID actually was and, um, you know, instituted into our policies and procedures. Um, you know, our health promotion team uh, regularly at Noongar Radio putting out those messages and updating our Facebook page. Um, uh, I, I covered our clinical flow changes in terms of infection control. Um, there was suspension of all non-essential services and just making sure that our core service delivery was uh, maintained. Uh, we were really proactive in terms of assistance to our vulnerable clients. Um, we and SWAMS um, through, uh, you know, funding through IUE uh, now have a really intensive service in terms of taking our services to our most vulnerable and making sure that they don't slip through the cracks and miss out. Um, so, oh, so massive uptake of telehealth and phone, phone consultations and for the most needy, sending out GPs to them in their homes, um, but make, making sure that our um, staff, uh, you know, had adequate personal protective equipment. Um, uh, we, we stood down non-essential services um, and casual staff just to make sure that, you know, we, we truly just focused on our um, core service delivery. Uh, Pregnant and immunocompromised frontline staff and um, vulnerable staff of ours, because many of our staff within AMSs are, you know, have multiple uh, chronic illnesses. So, you know, we those staff were able to work from home, um, but you know, you know, now we we have all staff back um, on board, um, and fantastically, we were able to secure funding for two respiratory clinics one in the northern suburbs in Mirabuka and one in the southern suburbs at Maddington. And I can report that, um, you know, the, the demand for those two respiratory clinics has been fantastic. So at least 50, 50 clients a day being seen in those respiratory clinics. Um, yeah, so uh, I just have some, some data that so during the peak of the pandemic, there was an average of 205 telehealth consultations that were delivered and over 50 vulnerable clients received home services, including food delivery from our welfare support team. Under an alternative model of care with strong screening practices, a daily average of 175 clients continue to access care across our four metropolitan um, clinics in Perth. So yeah, um, I think you know the key key response was rapid and evidence based practice in terms of the response. Oh, thank you. That was it's a huge area that you cover. That was fantastic, and I think the telehealth thing is going to be something of, of great interest. And I think what all of you are underplaying is the incredible success of the videos. Uh, uh, with the health promotion videos on virus information, which are far better than anything we had for the non-Indigenous population. Um, uh, but uh, Sandri, uh, can you uh, give us your perspective on uh, on this whole issue? Thanks, Fiona. It's a great opportunity to look back. You know, the first case in Australia was on about the 22nd, 23rd of January. February, it was grumbling away. And in, in March, um, we were just you know, waiting and expecting we would do as badly as other countries in the world and that Indigenous Australians would be similarly affected. Uh, I think what's, what's complemented what's happened on the ground in places like Bunbury and Perth through SWAMS and Derbal Yerrigan is existing, ex the, the existing network of, um, of national representation mm -hmm. And, and activity that filters down through this network to these frontline services. So a big congratulations to Pat Turner and Don Casey and the leadership of NASHO with the uh, Coalition of Peaks 
and great people in there like their Chief Medical Officer, Jason Agostino. Um, I think the representation nationally and locally and that network was really existed pre-COVID and was activated really effectively. Um, James Ward um, feeds into the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia. Alex Brown and myself have um, a lot of involvement with the National Health and Medical Research Council. And we were both appointed members of the National um, Research and Advisory Committee for COVID-19 that the NHMRC activated. So I think at the Commonwealth level and filtering down to the states and territories, Aboriginal people and organisations have, you know, carefully co cultivated this system of health, health advocacy, um, representation, political lobbying, and it, and, it, and, it, and it connects right down to these frontline clinics in, uh, in local communities, local suburbs like Mirabooka and Maddington, where Durbel now runs um, two respiratory clinics. Um, I, I do think we were really worried this might have a devastating impact. We know that in the usual flu season, um, the, 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 that's difficult for older Aboriginal people with higher burden of chronic diseases and uh, frailty that makes them more vulnerable um, to the impacts of these infections. And, and even for middle-aged people and younger people, the way the social determinants would be a barrier to Aboriginal people being able to leverage and protect themselves and their families if they acted on an individual level. It was really the activation of acting in, in, as groups of people, which is very strongly embedded in our culture. Um, groups of families, groups that um, coalesce to run community controlled health services and that, that network of working together as groups of, of state and territory peaks. And so the, so the response included things like the urgent biosecurity measures to restrict entry to remote Aboriginal communities, um, the rollout and act, activation of gene expert testing machines so that there were point of care tests available in remote communities, but we also knew that a lot of our population lives in urban centres and wherever there's an interface between our community and the rest of the Australian community, if there are outbreaks, we're vulnerable. And we're not really through it yet. We're no. through the first phase mm -hmm. of this and we're not sure how much it's the new normal. Um, so how much, you know, having got through that acute phase, it's not over. There's a way that we have to continue to work to protect families and communities and, um, and, and activate services. So, and still be able to roll out good preventative care, which is really the foundation of Aboriginal community controlled health services, you know, ensuring people get their flu vax, pneumovax, um, health literacy. I was amazed at how quickly the message filtered through the Aboriginal community and just ordinary people we know suddenly cottoned on to coronavirus. They were quite comfortably talking about coronavirus in the community as well and starting to get the implications of what that meant for them and others. And, and you know, the, the work around health literacy was as important as the work around, you know, health service delivery. And that's a key point for Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, you know, ensuring that our mob are empowered about their health and their health efficacy, you know, their, their ability to manage their multiple chronic illnesses, you know, at a one, one, stop, one stop shop that AMSs are is, is so important to our services successes, I reckon. Mm. Oh, look, thank you so much, Sandy. And of course, what you're referring to, Francine, is the trust. Mm. The fact that these services are trusted, they're not racist. Um, mainstream services are still racist and very difficult for many Aboriginal people. They don't feel accepted and welcomed in them. And I think that's a huge issue. And of course, we've had this most amazing Black Lives Matter, um, which is all to do with those sort of issues um, in our society. Um, so Dan, uh, Dan McCauley, um, up to you now to finish off the, the small, short presentations before we have the questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for my double promotion, but I'm actually here working as the director of the Centre for Improving Health Services for Aboriginal Children and Families. Um, so I'm really interested in that sort of health service area of this. So 
just want to reiterate what Sandy was saying that um, we're, we're, we're just in, we're still in the pandemic phase of the continuum. So we're not actually, I don't think anywhere near that sort of transition phase into sort of recovery. But I think what's, um, what for me, the most important thing that's, been evident so far is is the focus on that this amazing relationship that's occurred between all of the community control sector and various state and territory and commonwealth governments and i and also i think the community response to this pandemic has um been uh, astonishing and amazing um and i think that you know uh, it, it, we need to continue that there's some really great examples that i know of from western australia that have shown sort of that sort of really strong community um, sort of driven leadership um, and activity. You know, in the Fitzroy Valley, there was a really big push early on to get um, uh, people back to community before community was locked down. And that was really successfully driven by actual community people on the ground there. So that was great. The work that was done here in Perth to provide um, accommodation for the large homeless population that we see in Perth and I'm sure in other metropolitan areas. Um, and they're a group that was in, are incredibly vulnerable during, during this pandemic. And, um, and that was really, um, you know, a, a really rapid and great response. I think, the, I think that what everyone said so far is that fantastic um, sort of health promotion messaging that has occurred around physical distancing and hand washing. I think it's been, um, uh, it, it's been better than what I've seen um, in mainstream and from other countries. I think that's something that you know, um, Aboriginal community control are very good at. Um, however, I think that we have to realise that as we eventually move into the transition phase, which is around the recovery and preparedness for the next pandemic, is we need to do what we can do to ensure that the community-led response is maintained so that there is a really good focus on being vigilant, um, you know, looking at surveillance to make sure there's no sort of outbreak, second waves, third wave, etc. And I think um, also during this uh, recovery phase, we need to look at how the, um, the amazing rapid health service redesign that had to occur to protect our community. We have to look at what the unintended consequences and impact that may be having on um, the health of people. So we know that, um, you know, there, we, in the, with these rapid health uh, redesigns that we have these unintended consequences due to, you know, the, the change, you know, there's changes in health seeking behavior there's um, changes in health service delivery. Um, we need to review of how well we did and to how to plan for the next pandemic. So looking at these unintended consequences is really about how we can do better next time and how we can sort of minimize um, the, the impact so far. And I think to do this effectively, we need to maintain this really strong relationships that has, have been developed and um, that, that it's really been a whole of system um, response with community control leading, you know, state, territory and Commonwealth health governments in this area. And I think it's a really good opportunity to utilise this to address other public health issues such as poverty, racism, the chronic diseases and also the, 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 the issue of um, justice, racism and justice that we're seeing now. So I think um, I think, you know, we've done amazingly well. We've done um, amazingly well if we look at say the Navajo, Navajo Nation in the US, which have been really impacted. They have a, um, a rate of infection, which is twice that of New York at the moment. So, and sort of the, the polar opposite. So I think um, we should be really proud of what we've done and we need to keep it up and we need to just drive it forward. Thank you. Thanks so Thank you. much, Dan. I think that's really important. I think what's coming through for me as well, and I'd, I'd be interesting to get Richard Dennis's comments on this, how cost effective is it giving Aboriginal people a voice, giving them power? I mean, this is unheard of, this success. It's the best in the world by a country mile. And it surely is. I mean, how many, how many uh, hospitalizations, how many intensive care beds, how many deaths have been prevented by this ama amazing leadership? Um, and surely this has got huge implications for how we go forward. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, I think they should be congratulated. They, they covered every single area that had to happen to ensure this epidemic pandemic did not decimate them. Uh, look, absolutely. And, you know, you know, I was on a panel with you a couple of weeks ago, Fiona, where I, I first heard 
about this remarkable success. And uh, I've been talking to people about it ever since. And, you know, Australia is so used to hearing, oh, it's wonderful. Because yeah. it's so used to, uh, we're so used to in Australia about hearing how Indigenous people have fallen behind and we have some obligation to help Indigenous people and all the nonsense that we, you know, we, 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 we have in our public debate when inquiry after inquiry for decades has said, regardless of the problem, whether it's a health problem, whether it's an education problem, whether it's a justice problem, the first step is to sit down and talk to the community about their perception of the problem and their expectations of a solution and get some, uh, get some genuine feedback before policy is designed uh, worst case scenario from Canberra, best case scenario by the people uh, involved in it. We've heard this for decades and it's typically paid, played lip, paid lip service. And what we've now seen is this remarkable success, not just domestically, but internationally, remarkable success where, as you said in the introduction, groups that statistically should have had all of the risk factors going against them ha have outperformed the rest of the community. Why? because the intervention started with a conversation. The intervention started from listening and respect and designing back from what the community needed. So from a democratic point of view, I'm, I'm, I just think that's the right thing to do. From an evidence-based policy point of view, it's the right thing to do. And, and finally, and lastly, from an economic point of view, it's cheap. Can you imagine? <laughs> But that's not the reason to do it. Like that's, this is just the, the benefit is we're treating people in our community with respect. We're listening to evidence about how to design policy. Oh, and by the way, that's the cheapest thing we could have done. Can you imagine how expensive it would be to, uh, to run a health intervention in remote communities for hundreds or thousands of people uh, in, in remote communities if, if COVID-19 had have taken off in those communities? It's incalculable what the cost would have been or what the tragedy would have been to, to not intervene in that way. So time will tell, but uh, it, it's not just wonderful to, to hold this up as an example to say, you know, maybe from now on, could we do this in relation to all sorts of policies in remote communities and the Indigenous community and cities, as you said, but let, not only is it good, not only does it work, but uh, particularly if we'd have had to deal with a large outbreak in, in multiple remote communities, it, it, it would have been beyond us. Mm, absolutely. And of course, there's no excuse now because there are so many outstanding Aboriginal uh, uh, people with training. Um, we now have an Aboriginal data sovereignty movement, which every single person who's spoken today has been involved in, which means Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people taking control of their own data. And the results are extraordinary when they do that. And there's an Aboriginal health research network that's proposed that Sandra and Dan have been working on too, which means that there'll be a galvanising, a collaboration across the nation of uh, competency in Aboriginal health research. I mean, these guys know how to do stuff. And I mean, it's not just fire practices, it's, it's health promotion. They're bloody good at it. <laughs> so we need to, to listen. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. Uh, and it certainly, you know, is impressive to hear about not just the achievements, but for the sheer hard work that that went into it. I was um, just exhausted listening to that by the end. That's just a monumental effort. Um, I did want to welcome everyone uh, who's joining us today. We've had about 700 people log on, more or less, and I've got people from Noongar, Gadigal, Wurundjeri country, uh, from Turbal, from Mamu country in far north Queensland. So we've got people from right around the country. Um, thank you for joining us today. Just a reminder that if you'd like to ask someone on the panel a question live, um, you can use the raise your hand function. And I can see that uh, someone called Jasmina would like to ask a question. I'll come to you uh, in just one second, Jasmina. Um, but my first question is from uh, Chris Toomey that asks, how have staff coped with the additional pressure of COVID-19 and how have they been supported, recognising that many might also be caring for elders uh, at home and hence worried about the risk of, of taking COVID-19 home? Can I, can I answer that? Absolutely. Um, and this is from within SWAMS and I want to congratulate all the staff at SWAMS uh, for us in, a, in looking at how we address the workforce. All our staff had to go undergo infection control training 
Um, this was an online training from the Department of Health. Um, we introduced two days paid leave with COVID-19 symptom -like, uh, symptoms to encourage voluntary disclosure because we've seen in the media many times that people have gone in who have had COVID um, into places where vulnerable um, elders and others have been. Um, for our staff was directed not to attend work if they had flu-like symptoms. Um, we ensured that we uh, utilised uh, our telephones and telehealth. Um, SWAMS also introduced um, COVID paid leave to assist employees that were affected um, by COVID and their families. So we held daily meetings attended by staff, keeping them informed and up to date um, um, each day. Uh, all training that was face-to-face -face was suspended and uh, shifted to online training. Um, work from home was encouraged. We had to draft policies very quickly uh, to enable the flexibility here for staff to work from home. And staff were encouraged to work from home when they were, their home was ready to do that as well. We ensured that, um, that um, you know, a change of uh, article, clothing articles uh, within lockers and bags were supplied uh, to ensure that they had the proper PPE equipment whilst within the clinics. Uh, just to ensure that once they left the clinics that they were not taking any of this, any infections to outside the clinic. So uh, very supportive of our staff uh, because as an essential service, uh, we had to continue to maintain up to be open. We also had to ensure they played a, a very important role in uh, reducing a lot of the anxiety. So ensuring that our staff were well trained and um, messages were conveyed, it was important that they um, was able to, um, you know, uh, do their work and, and feel that uh, it was a safe space to be operating in to come into work as well. Uh, one of the main things we looked at was the telehealth opportunities, which saw huge activities within our organisation um, with the engagement with the community. Um, so the community saw that we were reinforcing these strong messages and protocols. And so they, you know, that trust was continued as well. And um, yeah, very important. Um, Francine, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, uh, at Durbel, we, um, you know, um, switched, we encouraged, well, all clinical staff um, started wearing scrubs, um, big focus on personal protective equipment. We were cognizant that there was a lot of fear among the community about this virus before a lot of the education um, was rolled out and the messaging. So, you know, we, we uh, you know, in terms of infection control, the hand hygiene training online was everything switched to online um, and, you know, those key principles in terms of, um, you, you know, your, your PPE and infection control um, standards were, were implemented across all of our four clinics. Um, oh yes, and uh, the board agreed to two weeks COVID um, leave um, for anyone affected um, and fully supported our staff and put across that, you know, you're our biggest asset um, we're there to provide a safe workplace for you um, and encouraged um, those with, you know, chronic illnesses and um, to, to take, take that leave that the board had signed off on. Um, but very much one way flow through our clinics. Um, every morning at each of the four clinics, there were clinical huddles. Um, our medical director and, um, you know, executive, executive management team, those key messages, in terms of um, you know protecting yourself, were um, reinforced on a daily basis at those those clinical huddles. So yeah, very much um, our counselling staff were there to provide um, you know counselling regularly throughout the day to anyone who was concerned. And we know across our community there was so much fear. So you know having our staff empowered and feeling safe in their workplace was such a you know strategic. Uh, of strategic importance for our organisation. Thanks, Francine. Um, the next question is from Jai or Jay Dharma. Apologies if I've mispronounced that. Uh, this is absolutely wonderful, they say. Congratulations. And how do we apply the learnings from this success in improving health generally for First Nations people? Um, and how can we support that good work? I might come first to you, Sandra, and then to you, Dan. 
Ebony, I wonder if the urgency of this situation kind of stripped back the politics. There wasn't a, enough time for the politics to interfere with good, sensible um, decision making. You saw how rapidly we increased the um, new start allowance, how rapidly we made childcare free. Mm -hmm. you, you know, nationally, it was an environment where we, it was a major crisis. We had to respond quickly and politics took the back seat to pragmatism and sensible policy making and, and a lot of bipartisanship as well and a willingness for every everybody to pitch in and do their thing and, and do make sensible decisions. So um, I've never seen this level of cooperation in my career ever. So I, I really hope that um, you know there are there are ways we can we can not just, you know, flip back to our old way of doing things and and, and playing the politics around Aboriginal health and um, empowerment of Aboriginal communities. Um, and I, I really hope that um, that other things like telemedicine, some of the things that will that have been embedded quickly that will remain um, can be supported and well used by Aboriginal health services and you know have direct and ongoing impact. Thank you. Dan, did you want to add something to that? Um, I, I'd agree. I think, you know, uh, politics have, were put, as, uh, put aside, um, issue that needed to be dealt with rapidly, saw um, everybody come together. And if we can maintain that, I think we can apply that to, to um, other issues. And I, I um, yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you. What about uh, a voice? What about a voice enshrined in the Constitution and the Uluru Statement from the Heart? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good point. We'll come to that in just a second. Um, I've got a question from Jamie. Jamie, can you hear me? I can. Kaya, What's everyone? your question? Um, I'm just wondering if anybody wants to speak to the risks that we face around funding at the moment. Um, in that, my understanding is so much of this work actually was. Um, from the goodwill of the service providers and the workers, you know, like it was above and beyond. People were working 60, 80 hour weeks. There was a huge amount of grassroots activation and people in their own communities kind of delivering goods and services as well. What's the risk of the government saying, well, we did so well before, we don't need to increase funding. Um, and you guys have kind of got it handled. Like, does anyone have any comments around that? Um, I think I think we've, you know, we'll be thinking and talking and analysing data and reviewing systems for months to years to come to really understand what's happened over the last three to six months. Um, and I, I agree there's a risk that, oh, well, you know, even in the worst conditions, what you've got currently is sufficient. Um, I think we've got to go back to basics and still you know, yeah. fight the bigger fight, which is health equality for all Indigenous Australians. And, and there are some things we can take away from this acute and urgent situation and that we need to take into account for, you know, the possibility of future pandemics mm -hmm. in the short to medium term, not a hun another 100 years on this scale. This may not be the worst pandemic we face in, a, in our lifetime. So uh, I, I would, I think we've, We've got to um, still get on with business as usual things and the advocacy and the activation and engagement of Aboriginal communities and people around adequate resourcing and a thorough and systematic approach to um, the whole Close the Gap campaign and the health equity targets. Um, and I, I still think, you know, higher level issues around, um, you know, um, constitutional change and all of those things are still on the table. Mm. Um, Richard, did you want to say anything about um, funding and costs there? What are the likelihoods that this success will be rewarded? <laughs> or punished? Um, yeah, look, let me oh. just reiterate, <laughs> you know, what Francine just said is remarkable. I mean, in, in short, what a terrifying observation. We, we didn't have time to be racist. We didn't have time to be patronising in the rollout of policy. We, we just had to jump straight to what works. So uh, again, you know, congratulations to everyone involved in that. But uh, yeah, what, what a terrible thought that Indigenous uh, 
the Indigenous health community might be punished for its success. You can imagine it now, can't you? Look, see, you got through all that with, with what scant funding was available. Why on earth would you ever need more? Well, the answer is, of course, because the health statistics are so so terrible for so many parts of the Indigenous community. And we need to roll out policies as successful as this across countless other uh, health, uh, health issues. We now know which ones work. We need to roll out multiple health interventions at multiple scales to address significant health disadvantage in the Indigenous communities. And if we do that, again, it's the right thing to do it's also in the long run the cheap thing to do but let's never make the case that we should do it because it's cheap let's always start with that it's right and it's fair and it's good but yes there is plenty of evidence that in the long run uh, it's actually cheap what what are the opportunities Ed? well i keep telling people this that i know it's hard to hear um there is no budget constraint there is no budget constraint there is no shortage of money everything you've ever been told your whole professional lives is no longer true you've just watched a coalition government announce 200 billion dollars in new spending and it's barely begun so we are going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars in the coming years we are going to that's going to happen we're just haggling about what and uh, at the event that i did with fiona recently i spelled out some criteria for what's good intervention uh, put people first go with labor intensive stimulus packages go to local communities where it's needed and do things that have lasting benefits is there any more obvious candidate uh, for good stimulus spending than uh, than than labor intensive health interventions in disadvantaged communities will that happen maybe maybe not should that happen well uh from as a citizen absolutely and as an economist what's what's the better option on the table mm -hmm. thanks Richard. i think that's um, fantastic i think that uh, the, uh, with, with the, will the coalition of peaks get this information and drive it is and sandy the fact that you're on the national advisory committee so you know it, it seems to me that this is an urgent and wonderful opportunity to push on these issues Oh, hang on. Fiona, I, th I think that, that what we highlighted earlier, that, that, that network of national representation and opportunity um, to, to really um, actually now start planning for the future months and years and how to lobby and advocate for, you know, a continuation of these systems. And it's great to hear uh, Richard make that point about We've just taken the lid off and, and we will have to spend, continue to spend to get out of um, the risk of a, a major and ongoing recession. And, and, and the spend in, in this acute phase was relatively limited. I wasn't impressed with any major funding announcement. Um, a lot of this is, as, as you say, happened on very thin spending, but the activation of systems effectively, you know, just because of the love and the care that these organisations have for the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. um, the next question that I've got is from Sharon Holmes, and uh, she asks, how can these strategies transfer to other issues that impact Indigenous people? Um, and I was just going to have a word. We've got some quite a, quite a lot of interest in the videos that have been mentioned, so I might track those down if I can and uh, we'll, we'll put links to those along with the video recordings of this. Um, but I did want to put, I guess, all of this and that question in the context of the Black Lives Matters movement and the end to Aboriginal deaths in custody. Obviously, there's huge numbers of other uh, health issues as well as social issues um, uh, faced by the Indigenous community uh, at the moment. So uh, I'm not sure who wants to, to speak to that, but yeah, what are the opportunities here to transfer this very successful model into other areas of Aboriginal controlled services and service provision? Ebony, can I just say generally, you know, um, I, I was pretty amazed by the, the way Black Lives Matters, Matters um, popped up in the middle of this global crisis. Mm -hmm. It's as if the world had enough and, and, you know, oppressed minorities just cracked and 
said no more, we're not tolerating this. And they were in North America getting the worst end of the bargain, having the worst outcomes from COVID um, when that, that initially happened. But I always remember by 2030, there'll be over a million Indigenous Australians. And we're not isolated in Australia anymore because of globalisation, social media, the way in which we're, it's hard to control the message globally anymore. It's not controlled by major media networks. That, you know, there are these community activated networks. So we're part of a community, you know, a global community of minorities. So I don't think with, with the growing number of Indigenous Australians in this country that any of this broad local up to state, up to national advocacy is going away. Mm. Um, I'm just so impressed that we have so many Aboriginal people um, in, the, in the national parliament, both in the Senate and the House of Reps. Mm. Um, and, and in state and territories. And I, I just think we remember marching as students in the 80s and, you know, in the 90s. And I'm just so pleased that both at a grassroots level in the community and, and at an organised system way in, in government and NGOs and other parts of the country, we, we, I, I, I don't expect that advocacy to go away. Mm -hmm. And I hope the politics around this improves and we can see this as a demonstration of success and expect success in other areas. Um, Leslie, did you want to add anything to that? It's um, an opportunity here to um, revisit uh, the work we've been doing. Um, like we said, we're not out of um, the crisis yet. And however, I think there's a blueprint um, that's required here, you know, for further situations um, that can be reviewed and looked at in other sectors. Um, for us, it's about making sure that we've identified and under understood the things um, that have um, been handled really well and the things that could have been done better as well. And making sure that we do a financial and economic uh, analysis of the impact on our business and our sector uh, can only act as, um, like I said, a blueprint for, you know, other sectors going forward here um, and understanding the nature of that. And the feedback is critical um, from our communities uh, in terms of, um, you know, to see whether that, how successful that was or what success did it play in this part. And um, we know there are many areas um, in our communities across this country uh, that we have to, you know, now look at and step up and ensure that we've got the capability. Building the capabilities and, and injecting resources into this space is critical um, so that, um, you know, this can flow on uh, to make um, and look after the health and well-being of our Aboriginal people across this country. Thanks, Leslie. Dan, I can see you nodding your head along there. Is there anything you'd like to say as well? Yeah. Um... Unintended consequences aren't always negative. So one of the unintended consequences are some of the good things that have come out of this that we, we, we will be learning from. And one of the biggest unintended consequences is that now community control, community are at this table and can't be removed from the table now. So it's an opportunity to drive that leadership with these other issues. So um, yeah, I think we've just got to onward and upward. Um, Dan, I did want to ask you about that, uh, the unintended consequences, and you kind of talked about other health issues, including uh, issues of justice and of racism. I just wonder for lay people on this webinar who might not be familiar with that idea, can you just unpack what that means? Yes. Okay, so just quickly, we've been looking at uh, uh, what's been happening elsewhere. So we know that there's been changes in health seeking behaviour because of the fear of going to a, uh, an accident emergency or going to a hospital. So we know there's this negative sort of um, thing impacts from the outbreak. So we've seen a number of in, uh, in Italy, there's been a number of um, childhood deaths because of fears of taking children to hospital because of the condition that they have. Um, so it's really around things that we didn't think of in the heat of the moment. Um, so children aren't getting, we know that children aren't getting face-to-face -face child, regular child health checks. So there may be issues down the line from this. We know that children may not be getting their um, immunizations on time. So 
um, it, we know that we may have some problems down the line with perhaps another small outbreaks of measles, et cetera. We don't know. Unintended consequence in the positive is this really great use of telehealth. So if we can take that forward, we can get care closer to home so people can have access to, to care better. So it's really the things that we don't know um, occur because of um, you know, the, the changes to deal with the pandemic. Um, and Francine, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? I might just come to everyone on that question. <laughs> oh, look, I was just thinking, you know, if there are economists, health economists who wanted to work with us to write some papers, post this and, you know, go through those lessons learned um, with us as an organisation for, you know, preparedness for, for next time or the next stages of this pandemic, that would be appreciated. Um, I, I always think to myself, any, you know, major incidents or issues that, that occur within our service, you know, regularly looking back and what were those key lessons that we learned from our experiences um, to inform pra future practices, clinical practices is um, something that's so important. Thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid we might have to wrap it up there. I'm terribly sorry. I can see a, a huge number of questions there that we haven't been able to get to, but I did want to thank uh, in particular all of our panelists today. So thank you to Leslie Nelson, Francine Eads, Professor Sandra Eads and Associate Professor Dan McCauley. Thank you so much for your time today. And to you, uh, Fiona Stanley, uh, for helping pull this all together and for your wonderful introduction and observations. And to Richard Dennis, our Chief Economist at the Australia Institute. And thank you to all of you for coming along today and for all of those wonderful questions. Uh, as I said, about 700 of you uh, have joined this webinar from around the country. We really appreciate it. And um, we're, we're glad that you continue to support this Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. Um, uh, you can join us next Wednesday for a webinar on navigating the Australia-China relationship, something we don't seem to be doing a particularly great job of at the moment. And that's with Professor Jane Golly, economist and director at the Australian Centre on China in the World at ANU. And she'll be in conversation with Alan Beam, director of the Australia Institute's International and Security Affairs Program. That's next Wednesday, the 1st of July, 2020 at 11 a.m. Um, and just a warning that Zoom is making a start to use passwords from July. So uh, all of these in future will require a password. I'm really sorry, I know that's a bit of a pain, but they're making us do it. And you can register for future webinars at tai.org.au forward slash webinars. A reminder that we'll make a recording of this webinar available on our website and we'll send it to everyone who has registered. So if you had to duck out, uh, you'll be able to get a copy of that. And lastly, it's the end of financial year and the Australia Institute is running its end of financial year appeal. Um, we're an independent think tank and so we do rely on donations. Uh, if you're able to chip in a few dollars to help cover the cost of these webinars, which we'll continue to provide for free, we'd greatly appreciate it. And you can head to our website at tai.org.au to chip in if you're in a position to do so. Uh, I'll also make sure to collect some of the videos that were spoken about today and some of those other resources, and I'll put them in the same place as the video recording today for anyone who's interested in some of those um, uh, health promotion and health awareness videos that were mentioned. Um, and lastly, make sure that you stay one and a half metres away, keep washing those hands, and thanks for tuning in. We hope to see you soon. Thanks again to all our panellists. Bye, everyone. Thank you.